is your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP where I spent the last two plus decades of my life. You know, I'm on my way to the smooth. I think it's special managing, monitoring, managing unit. It's basically just a program for disciplinary cases or cases they consider disciplinary. So if you catch a hundred series shot back to back within the same year, you're eligible for the program. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna qualify for it, but you're eligible. If you catch a couple 200 series shots and 100 series shot back to back. I mean, the qualification varies. And sometimes you might not even catch a shot, but the administration feels that you're disruptive or too inf influential and they don't want you on their compound. They might try to submit you to the smooth or to ADX. Like in the last video, I told you a DC guy named Kevin he didn't get written up for anything. He was just under investigation. But Matt Volson, the warden at the time, felt that he was responsible for certain things coming into the prison and this and that, and end up kept submitting him to ADX until they accepted the program, until they accepted him into the program. You know, I'm just taking you through the course of my bid, my travels, the things that I've seen, the stories that I've heard and the characters that I've met. I wasn't sure if I wanted to share this story with you because it's from third, fourth hand person. I didn't hear it directly from the people that was involved, nor was I there on the compound at the same time. But as I was going to the SMU, when we went to Victorville for the holding, there was people being processed out as we're coming in and there, <clears throat> and there was people on the bus with me that they picked up from other spot that was in Victorville at the same time, relayed this story to all of us that was in holding. Again, when I got through the Oklahoma, you know, from Victorville, we got on an airplane and went to Oklahoma. And in Oklahoma, while you're on the, while you're on the plane or when you come off the plane, you're in, you know, you're, you're right there with each other in a little holding until they process you. And again, somebody that was in Victorville at the same time shared this story with me again. So I feel confident that I can share you this story because I've heard it from three different people and the story was the same. Now this happened probably around 2012, 2013, maybe earlier. I don't know the year, so don't hold me on it. But the first time I heard this story was from Beaver. Beaver was a, a white guy that we that lived in my unit that came from Victorville to Atwater, and he lived in my unit. We became cool, and he ended up getting beat up because you know he let a bicep take off on him and didn't do anything. Well, the story goes, there was this white guy that came out, out of ADX. I don't know the guy's name, and I don't know how long he was in ADX or why he was in ADX, but by all account, he was a certified killer. Excuse the noise in the background. I think they got people uh, mowing their lawns and whacking their weeds or whatever. But, um, you know, this guy, he's in there, he was in ADX for murder for bodies, they already got bodies. And you know, you go through, ADS is a minimum of seven year program. You're locked down, you start at whatever level they start you at, the highest security where there's no human contact. I've been to every secure level in the federal prison except for ADX. I've been committed to ADX twice, but the program refused me because I didn't, quit, I didn't quite fit the criteria even though the administration or my judge thought that I should be housed in ADX, the program in ADX didn't accept me. So it takes a lot for you to get to ADX. I mean, the quickest way to get to ADX is stabbing or killing a staff. You'll get there real quick. 
And that was the reason why they tried to commit me to ADX because I had knocked out a guard back when I was waiting to be sentenced. But a lot of people that go to ADX are people that they seem, that they deem a little more dangerous than that their average population. And is reserved also for those with a lot of influence, a lot of power, a lot of authority. Because anybody like that on the compound, their administration fears them. Because they know that if they try to implement a policy or some rule or some changes to the prison that the inmates or the population don't agree with, these individuals that have these respect and a, this stature can influence on how the yard reacts to the changes in policy. Well, the story goes with this individual, he's a white guy. He came from ADX. From all account, he was quiet, kept to himself or whatever. But you know, he's been down a while. And he dips and dab in the hustle. And I guess he sold, you know, papers. Papers is what we call little packages of dope. And uh, he had a list of people that owed him money. You know, they say he had a long list. And when Beaver was sharing me the story, he was one of those individuals that was on the list that owed this individual some money. So I think he lived in six block on the second tier. And uh, on this particular day, he's got his list of all the people that owes him. He goes out and calls one of the individual, you know, one of the guys that, that's on his list that owes him money and invites him into his cell. You know, our cell is small. It's uh, eight by 12. You know, the newer prison, the cell's a little bit bigger as opposed to like the cells in Lompoc. The cells in Lompoc were literally like eight by shit. I don't even know it was eight feet wide, but it's like nine feet long and maybe seven, seven by nine, because you can sit on your bunk and put your feet up on the wall. That's how small the cell in Lompoc was. And from the space between your bunk, there was maybe about a six inch gap between the door and about maybe another foot gap between your bunk and the wall and the toilet. So when you're coming in, you have this much space, you have maybe a foot to walk between your bunk and your locker. And some lockers that are set up, the cell is so small, you can't even open the locker door all the way. That's how small Lompoc was. And those were just like the older blocks, but they had, you know, built some other blocks with the cells bigger. But in the shoe, it's seven by nine. There ain't no room to wiggle. And I just don't understand how people can put two people in those cells. You know, we're grown ass men. And no matter how close you are, no matter if that's your friend or if that's your brother, you spend a few months in a, such a confined space like that, eventually you're gonna get at each other's throat, which I will share with you when we get to the SMOOTH program. But on this particular day, this white guy, he comes out and he calls a dude that owed him money, invites him into the cell. So the guy comes in and you know he's got a spoon and a syringe, we call it an outfit, you know, hooked up on a table because, you know, these guys are on for dope. So they know, he knows that people that are users, when they see it, there's certain chemicals in their body that reacts to seeing the drug or smelling it. And it's hard to resist it, especially if it's being offered for free. So the guy calls this one guy in and he comes, and he comes in and says, hey, come on in. You know, the guy comes in the cell, he sees this there, you know, there's stuff set up on the table for someone to get high. And he's like, hey, you wanna get high? He's like, yeah, yeah. So he lets the guy fix up, fix his own, you know, fix his little issue up, shoots his shot. And if anybody knows when you inject it, it hits you immediately and you're high. You can tell right away if the dope is good or if the dope is bad. And they're high. Now while they're high, he asked him, because in his cell, he's got a big commissary bag. You know, like I said, this story is being relayed to me first 
from Beaver and then two other individuals on my way to the smooth. So for entertainment purposes, or just to give you guys an idea of some of the craziness, shit that you probably can't even fathom and imagine that goes on in there, shit happens in there. And you know, whatever Hollywood can come up with without the special effects, fiction can never match the reality. You know, the capacity for violence or psychotic behavior is sometimes beyond our understanding. But to this individual's mind, he wasn't doing anything wrong, but holding people accountable for the debt that he owed him, that they owed him. So he points out the big ass commissary bag that he's got in his cell. He's like, hey, I'll make you a deal. I said, if you let me tie your hands up and if you can get out of it, I'll give you this whole commissary bag. You know, they tell me the first person, I mean, there was nobody in the cell with him. So the dialogue really, like I said, I can't repeat anything verbatim, nor can they when they were telling me the story. Because like I tried to share with you guys, I always want my things to be factual and I always want my things to, you know, to be beyond scrutiny. But like I said, I've heard it from three different individuals that was there at the time in Victorville. So the guy ties the guy's, uh, so the white guy ties his victim's hands up, offer them that, hey, if they can break out of this freaking thing, they can get out of this restraint, that they'll win a, a bag of commissary. So the dummy, he's high, his mouth is drooling, he sees there's a big ass bag of commissary, thinking it might be an easy come up, allows this white dude to tie his hands up. So when the guy tie, finishes tying his hands up and the victim is there trying to struggle, to, you know, trying to break out of it so he can win his bag of commissary, the dude comes from behind him, wraps a rope around his neck and strangles him. Strangles him until he dies. When he dies, he puts him under the bunk. Boom. Now he's got his blanket on his bunk hanging over the bunk so you can't see under the bunk. So he puts the body under his bunk. After he secured his first victim, he goes back out and looks on his list for another name. And he sees somebody else that owes him money. Well, he invites that individual in and does the same thing. He invites the individual in, he's got his dope set up, and ask the guy if he wants to get high. The second guy, of course he wants to get high. Who doesn't want to get high for free? Anybody that does dope, smoke, whatever, who's going to turn down a free high, right? So, yeah, sure. The guy fixes it up himself or whatever, gets high. Once again, when the guy is high, the white guy offers him, a, you know, the same deal. Say, hey. You want this bag of commissary? You know, if you let me tie your hands up and if you can get out of it, I'll give you this bag of commissary. You know, they have an old saying when something sounds too good to be true, 99 out of 100 times is too good to be true. And also, nothing in life is free. You know, we learn that through the course of our lives. You know, when I'm inside the penitentiary and I'm asking them somebody for some toilet paper or whatever I'm asking, you know, when the COs, they always like to tell you, oh, you guys get free water, you know, you guys got free water, you guys live for free, you guys live, you guys get eat for free, you know, our three meals in a cot. I said, these three meals ain't free. This fucking cell that I live in ain't free. This shit is costing me 26 years of my life. You know, but for them to understand that, it's a whole different topic. So the second victim 
offers up his hand, lets the old man tie him up. And once again, after he had his victim secured, he goes behind him, wraps the rope around his neck, and strangles him. That's two. He's got two bodies. Takes the dude off, this, off the chair, off the little stool that's in, in, on the table, puts him under the bunk. I know some of you guys are probably like, nah, this shit ain't real. Listen, I can't verify. I never looked it up, but I'm sure those of you that have done time and it was in Victorville at, that, at this time, please comment and verify if I got this story wrong. So once he secured the second guy, he goes out and looks for his third victim. Calls the third victim in. Same setup. Got the dope on the table. Got the big bag of commissary hanging by the table. But the third guy, when he comes in, for whatever, his spider sense is probably perked up and he runs out of the door. Now, Beaver was in the block and he said, at this time, he saw the door swing open, boom, and a guy running out of the cell. But they, you know, they didn't really think of anything of it because the guy in the cell, the one that's got the two bodies under his bunk, didn't pursue him. He just came and closed his door and went out about his business. Well, every day at four o'clock, throughout the whole penitentiary across the United States, we have count. Every prison locks and secures their inmates in their cell and does a head count. And they cannot open that prison back up until they're finished counting, call up region, and the number that region has for that facility matches what they count. So on this day, they locked everybody down for count, regular routine. They go around, they start counting. Well, there's two people missing. So they kept counting, kept counting, kept counting. And finally, you know, they're like, you know, like what's going on? We don't know where these two individuals are. But every unit, every prison that is built now has cameras in every unit. It has cameras when you come into the cell, has cameras in your unit, has cameras in the kitchen, has cameras in the library. Everywhere you go, there's cameras. There's only very rare, very few spots where there's blind spots where the cameras won't be able to see you. But even if they won't be, they're not able to see you at that particular spot, they got cameras leading up to that spot that if something happens, they can always run the cameras back and see who was the last one seen in that area. So, of course, they run the cameras back and I'm sure they saw two people go into this guy's cell, but never come out. So when the COs come into the unit, they go knock on his door. And they look in the window, they say the guy's on his bunk reading his newspaper. And the CEO say, hey, so-and-so, cuff up. And he's like, for what? You know, these staffs, they know every inmate. When you come in, your paperwork follows you. SIS has done, got a file on you, has done research on you, so they know who you are, what your crimes are, what your affiliate, who's your affiliates. They know everything about you. They know this guy just came from ADX. So he's like, hey, for what? And like, man, you know for what? So anyway, I mean, there's no way around getting away with anything in the penitentiary. You know, the only time you can get away with murder in the penitentiary is if you get into a confrontation and you invite that guy into your cell. Because if you're in his cell and you kill him, then they say you can't plead self-defense because you went over there. But if you're in the cell, you know, I've been told with people when I started doing my time, they say, hey, invite the guy into your cell and you have to make sure he's dead because if the guy doesn't die, then he can testify against you saying that you did whatever you did. But if the guy dies, there's no cameras in your cell. 
You can plead self-defense. You can say, hey, the guy was came into my cell and tried to rape me or try to stab me or whatever. But in self-defense, you're still going to get time, but it's the difference between getting 20 years, 10 years, or a couple years for self-defense. So they pull this guy out of the cell, and sure enough, they got two bodies under his bunk. You know, from the people that were in the unit from Beaver that was sharing me with the story, they say they saw him two, pull two bodies out of the bunk. And of course, after the incident, everybody gets wind of it. There's no secrets. And on my way to the smooth, that was the story that was shared to me. And I just thought I'd take a little break on you know, everything else that I was doing and just might, you know, I felt like you guys might be entertained by that one. But it just shows you, it just shows you that we live in an environment full of different personality, full of different degrees of violence and maybe even evil. You know, the penitentiary is full of condemned men, people that they deem are abnormal to the citizens in society that couldn't function in society. We come from all over the country, from every part of the country, and even some of the part of the world. And we're all thrown in there in a fucking pot and are forced to coexist. For the most part, we do a good job of coexisting considering all the different races, the animosity, the hatreds, the rival gangs, but always, sooner or later, some shit's gonna pop off. Sooner or later, some crazy shit like this is gonna happen. Welcome to the USP.